I'm Rodislav Moldovan and I'm, I'll talk to you about how you can develop an application in, um, how you can uh, de debug an application in, um, in production. And not only, basically in literally any environment. I'll give you one idea. I'm working for a, a bank in Luxembourg and uh, before doing uh, this kind of uh, analysis, developers were spending uh, from a couple of hours up to two weeks to understand what is happening. Many teams, many products, many apps, many everything. And it's very likely that you had uh, somewhat a similar experience yourselves. And um, they were doing uh, lots of uh, what we call uh, archaeology. I'm a software craftsman and archaeology is definitely not something that uh, we are promoting. And what is that is meaning literally reading logs and uh, trying to understand from, uh, uh, from the logs what is happening. So let's see how we can do, how we can do things differently. And uh, what we implemented at, uh, at the bank is uh, a different technology similar to, that one, to this one. It's just that one is a bit more expensive. So this one is much more affordable and for my clients and proposing mostly this one. To give you one, uh, some concrete uh, numbers, so we went from a couple of hours up to two weeks of debugging to 15 minutes for 80% of our problems. And uh, so 80% are, are solvable today in 15 minutes, and the rest 20 minutes, if they are not solved in the first 15 minutes, it can take up to one hour but no longer than one hour. So it's much max one hour and then everybody knows um, where to look. For example, if it, it's not solved on the spot, we at least know what is the team responsible and who can actually do the thing. So today I'm going to use some uh, notions like RUM, R-U-M, Real User Monitoring, APM, Application Performance Monitoring, and <coughs> Hotel, which is the most uh, trendy word is open telemetry. Uh, before that, it was called uh, open tracing, a little bit in between observability, and then a little bit in between distributed tracing, and uh, lots of things came, uh, in, together, uh, came in together, and uh, finally, open telemetry, hotel, this is the thing that uh, stuck. And today, you have quite a lot of uh, libraries that you can use for both uh, front-end and back-end, which are effectively oriented around open telemetry. Because open telemetry is not only performance and stuff and logging, it's as well metrics and whatever you can have in your application. So the objective is to investigate issues on front end without asking each client to send us the logs. And if the front end issue is caused by another brick, then what is the brick? And what exactly is happening? Why the things are uh, failing, falling? Um, and the objectives follow up. Basically, is there a way, uh, I don't know in what companies you are working, but quite often working in a company, what you, you have this situation where you want to know a problem and what is happening, you are trying to find the problem and somebody will tell you, oh, you want to see the logs? Right, you, want, you need to use that tool. Okay, fine, I'm going to use that, oh no, no. <coughs> you need to get access to it. Okay, I'm getting access to it. But I cannot see the logs, ah, you're right, because you need to get access to the index on that tool. And then, okay, I want to use, see some metrics. All ah, right, so for that one, you need another tool. And uh, this, the story goes on. That's why we call it uh, archaeology, because it's kind of uh, like that. So what if we can have a tool that has all the AI sweetness, developer friendliness, and cost effectiveness? Uh, this, this is possible. There are quite many of tools to, today, and I'm quite sure some of them you're using. So ground rule. The code of the apps is already done. We ain't going to do live coding. I'm going to show you some pieces of code, but the goal is just to show the setup. And then what we are going to see is how I, as a developer, can investigate stuff. So it's mostly about investigating and trying to understand what is happening, OK? Uh, before going there is uh, <coughs> how we can uh, do some investigation. I don't know if you know it. It's in French. It says me. Console log here, and the debugger is the, um, the face, the poker face just behind. So um, quite often people are doing exactly this, system out, uh, console log, uh, I don't know, stuff like that, which is 
it's possible, it's doable, of course, but don't. Um, so uh, there is another way is to ask the log. Basically, uh, when the user is complaining, you, you what you'll say, uh, hello, can you send me the logs? Well, I can tell you that it's quite difficult when uh, somebody of a bank system is having troubles uh, doing a payment of 50,000 and the payment is not passing. It's pretty difficult to say to that person, oh, you know what, open uh, press F12, yeah, right, uh, copy everything from the console, yeah, and send us by email. It will never work. Um, by the way, this is an actual product. Is a, is a product that tells you, uh, that guides you in life. So don't, don't ask the logs, okay? Uh, so ways to do it is you can use an APM. And the APM, as you see, is uh, basically observability behind the doors. And what is observability is something that's very hot right now. It's something that is very in demand. Lots of people are talking, but not everyone is putting it in place. So today we are going to use some of it, and the stack is um, the following. We have a React application that, that runs in Kubernetes. It really doesn't matter where it runs. Kubernetes is one place, okay? It's, it's running behind an Nginx in Kubernetes. We have a Spring Boot application, uh, because Java, and because I love Java, but it's Luxembourg GS, so why not React? Um, again, running in Kubernetes, we'll have ELK, which is, stands for Elasticsearch Logstash Kibana. Everybody knows it as ELK, even though everybody's using only E and K, like highly unlikely the L, because now we have file bits. And uh, we'll have a relational database in memory because it's very simple. The goal is really to see some uh, SQL-related stuff. We have Kubernetes because we want to see if Kubernetes can be investigated, if things running in Kubernetes can be investigated, if it really works and some uh, other stuff like Argo CD and O0 authentication. So this is the, the stack that most likely you'll have in your environment, meaning you'll have a place to de deploy, some kind of manager to see the logs, for example, or to see what's happening with your app, some uh, Nginx or Apache HTTPS, or in enterprise environments, IBM HTTP service, uh, it's very likely, and some kind of authentication. So let's, uh, let's go to the practical session and see. Hopefully you are eager to see some code. Uh, now, I have a little application here. I have the back and the front end, the back end and front end. So whenever I want to create a, um, uh, whenever I want to add the Elastic APM to my uh, front end application, as you see, uh, do you see in the back? It's readable for you? So, so, let me zoom it a little bit. So it's pretty much like that. I have the, all my classic uh, stuff and I have my Elastic APM run. Now, the thing is, this kind of uh, APM uh, apps, they often require to add something to your code. Basically, to add an agent that is going to be embedded in your code. This, this can create the following problems. First prob problem number one. First, we have a version, meaning that if you don't update your app, most likely you won't update your agent, and it's very likely that your stack can go further, the actual base stack where that collects everything, and your library is not going to be updated. So this can be the problem number one. Another problem with an agent is something, it's a library that goes into your application, meaning that you have something, an extra library to deal with, and you can have issues because this library might have a performance impact on your application. In real life, from my experience, the impact is very minimal. I mean, the impact is smaller than the, va than the added value of uh, APM. So I never have a problem with this. Now, since it's, uh, the question is, can we bypass, can we not use such a library? And the answer is yes we can use a, a different approach. Basically, instead of having a library inside, your applica inside our application, we can either inject it, which again will be the same agent, uh, by, by using Nginx or Apache HTTP, but this is not controlled and you cannot uh, test it locally to see if there are any conflicts with the library. Or what you can do as well, you can use a service mesh, I don't know if you are familiar with the concept, 
but basically in front of every single application you have, you have another small application that tracks everything that goes in and goes out. And in this way you can do what's called the distributed tracing. You can see who is calling what, we'll see this in practice. The problem is that there is no way to get the information from within your application. So if you want to get information from the app, you need to have something running within the app, okay? So you have a library. Now, once you have a library, it's not uh, for free. It's not for free, meaning uh, uh, some uh, apps are for free, some not, but you still need to enable it. And in this case, I have to write a little bit of code, nothing fancy. It's, this code is based on nvars. It's uh, the mechanic of injecting variables that I presented uh, in previous session of uh, Luxembourg.js in Kubernetes where you can uh, parameterize your containers or parameterize any front-end application without rewriting, recompiling, and changing it whatsoever, okay? So uh, it's using uh, uh, variables and uh, voila. This is how we will initialize APM. And this APM is precisely from the ELK stack. Regardless what you'll have, Dynatrace, um, Grafana Labs, Instana, what, uh, what we mentioned today, um, Datadog, New Relic, you'll find out that it's the same. You are, adding a, you are adding a dependency, you are initializing this dependency. And it's very important to initialize the, this dependency, like really, before you are creating, if it's a React application on uh, Angular or whatever, it's really good to initialize this application before you start your app. And this is important, I will show you afterwards why this is important. Because you'll get some intelligence that's important about the speed of uh, rendering of your page. Now, since we are doing this on front end, do we need to do it on back end? Because at the end of the day, some kind of front end will go, is going to do it on the back end as well. Well, the answer is yes. Regardless what your back end is, in this case, this is a Java project managed with uh, Maven. So we have the same agent from the same provider. The thing is that you have today two libraries. Libraries from the provider, precisely, New Relic, Dynatrace, whatever. They are personal libraries. They are personal agents. You have them, you can put in your application. And you'll have the maximum output with data inside your dashboard. What you can do as well, you can use open source, open telemetry libraries. As you remember, we just said before, open telemetry is the mother of them all, is the most popular and whatnot. So, you can use the open telemetry. However, there you'll have less intelligence. So either you choose to go with something cross-platform, less informative, something platform-specific, more informative. From my experience, you don't change uh, databases every day. You don't change lots of stuff every day. So honestly, you go with something specific and that's it. So uh, the same, you're adding a dependency. You have to enable it. And uh, there is no, nothing, uh, nothing special. It's very, very basic. You are starting on uh, something right before your application runs, and then you are good to go. If you don't have this kind of ifs to enable your application, your uh, agent, uh, when you are starting the app, especially for local debugging, you are going to get flooded with logs, with error logs that your IPM cannot connect to server. So simply, your application will become unusable, it can block, it, it will be really weird. So do apply the if. No, um, let me paraphrase it. Add some artificial intelligence, basically put an if. So um, <coughs> let's, look, um, let's look at the apps. So what we have, I have here an Argo CD. Argo CD is a manager that knows how to install applications in uh, Kubernetes. So what I have, I have running a backend, uh, you know it's Kubernetes, so lots of stuff going on for no reason. But it's fine, it's cool, we can sell it. And we can go to events for that and pay 500 euro for a ticket. But uh, it's, it's nice, so we have, yeah, right, it's this event. So um, what we have here, we have the logs from application. If somebody is really fond of read, uh, reading uh, Java logs, feel free, I'm not. Um, even though I love Java, I really don't like to read the logs. And I have another uh, front-end application. And surprise, surprise, if I'm going to the logs, 
I'm going to see the nginx logs because you see on you don't have front end logs on your back end. When in back end you, you at least you hear, see the logs because the back end apps they're running on your side. Front end it always runs somewhere else. So you cannot see the logs. So what you will see here is nginx and uh, it's cool, why not? But it's not the same. Now, how we can run an Elastic? You can install Elastic locally on your, um, in your environment. It's free. Uh, it's free up to a certain point. You can have uh, most of the features, distributed tracing, observability, metrics, lots of stuff for free. And you don't have for free some things that I'm going to show you in a moment. And what you can do as well, for example, if you are a startup or even if you are working in an enterprise institution, you can go to Elastic Co. and you create the deployment of Elastic where you provide a credit card. So if you'll, uh, I'm not going to create uh, one uh, right now. If you, is it working? It doesn't. And that is the reason. Ah, uh, yes, I need to create a credit card. So you have to believe me by word. I'm a very believable person, so. <laughs> Basically, when you are creating a deployment, there is a little form to follow, and then you say, what cloud? What, are the, what is the size of your ELK cluster? And that's it. And what you'll get, you'll get a instance, an instance like this one. So let's take a quick look of what this means. Basically, you'll get, you'll get this. Uh, let me put in, in F11. So, uh, yeah, let's put it like this. So what you see here is one instance of Elasticsearch, another instance of Elasticsearch, uh, some kind of load balancer, and then you'll have your APM, the server, the application that is going to collect the data, and Kibana, the user interface that we are going to use to do the investigation. So as you see, these kind of applications, they are coming in their own components. So it's really, it's not something that you can um, test at home, as they say. It's you really need somebody to take uh, care of it. If you are a startup, you don't have dedicated DevOps or you are doing the whole, you are the informatician of the company, then um, you can use this kind of services managed and you, are, uh, you need to use that. You, you just use the, the soft, you don't have to install or patch it. So let's go now to our thing. When you go to Elastic, you are uh, welcome for this kind of page. And what we see here is the thing that interests us the most is the observability part. So let's go for observability. I, I really love when Wi-Fi works, honestly, I'm so happy. So when we go for observability, we'll have lots of information, funny, nice, and so on, but interest us the most. I'm going to put it like this, this week. We'll have the services that are running uh, in our application. And the services, I have a backend and I have a front end. So let's try to do some stuff and see what happens, isn't it? Let's get, get our application. What we'll see, we'll have some information about what links are being uh, used, what kind of exceptions we have. And what's interesting here as well is the distributed traces of what happened in our application. So first, before going there, let's do some, uh, let's actually trigger some actions in our application. So let's go to the app. Uh, this is a very basic, this is a uh, very basic app that does nothing really. It's just a fictional company that I'm using like a pet store, you know, like a, an app that I'm using to do testing, nothing more. So this is, imagine it's a little company where you can uh, see patients, procedures, and doctor, nothing more. So I'm trying to, uh, to go through, to navigate in the menu. As you see, nothing is displayed, and that is because I have to log in. So let's go and have, uh, let's go and log in real quick. No worries, no worries, it's fine. Yeah, you see, it's fine. I have uh, just, I'm using LastPass, and as you see, it takes, LastPass is, is built in Luxembourg. It takes its time, you know? Uh, 
Oh no, now I didn't my phone. Let's throw something else. Let's use another user because my phone is recording. Uh, let's use this one. Ah, nice. Yes. So as you see, I'm logged in in the application, and now I'm going to navigate, and now I'm going to see the some content, which is cool. It's really nice. Now the question is the one thousand uh, dollar question. Can we see all of the problems that we just encountered? Can we see them? And if so, what can we see about them? So let's go to the overview of our um, becoming front end. And what we are going to see, we are going to see the same errors. And let's, what we are going to put, we are going to say in the last 15 minutes. So let's go for the last 15 minutes. We have no data to display, which is a sad story. Uh, however, the things are still loading, so let's give them uh, a moment. First thing, when you have an APM, that doesn't mean you always have live data. That's number one. Usually the data is coming five seconds later, 10 seconds later, one minute later. That's one uh, element. Second, when you have lots of applications and you're having the same problem occurring all the time inside your applications, literally any APM server is going to collect apps and then when they will see that the same problem is occurring again and again, they'll simply drop it. So you'll have a record, one record, if the problem happened 1,000 times, you'll have one record, that's it, of it. Because honestly, having 1,000 records of the same, uh, you'll have a metric saying that you had it 1,000 times, but the actual information, you'll have it one time, which is, uh, pretty logical. So let's see, it's still loading. Let's do a refresh. <laughs> um, if it's uh, not working right now, it's not a problem because I'm going to put this week and I'm going to use some historical data. Hopefully the thing will, uh, will arrive. Uh, now let's look at what, what is happening with some historical data. First of all, we can see the, the links and the things that were happening in our application. What, what transactions have been recorded, how much time they took, and with this, we, what we can know, what we can do, we can find what transactions are the slowest. We can uh, find uh, the information about which one is the slowest, which one is the fastest, uh, by doing some uh, basic sorting. And we can have the impact of our application. What we can have as well, which is pretty interesting, we, have, we can have the lat latency in our page, latency, and if I'm going to the user experience dashboard, and I'll say this week, what we'll have as well is uh, some information about how the page was rendered. So we will have uh, some page load time. I don't know if you see it well but we'll see that some pages took 1.2 seconds to load, some of them loaded faster, and uh, in this way you'll know if the application was fast enough or, is not, was, or was not fast enough. So why? So let's take a look real quick if the information about uh, our thing is there. Most likely it will not be. Now can somebody tell me why this can happen? Come on, you can do it. If you did JavaScript at least once, you most likely you'll you'll know this problem. Don't remember? I'll refresh you. Why the the information is not arriving to the APM server? And that is because I have two add-ons in my browser installed. You'll never believe that. But I have to disable these uh, wonderful browsers. For, for this, for my APM, and I have to disable these wonderful extensions for my application. So the thing number one, if ever your application, your browser have, you know, this kind of extensions, or for example, your users are using your amazing DuckDuckGo browser, or uh, which one is the, the Brave, Brave for example, or Opera, it's very likely you won't receive anything. So just simple, very basic. You will not know if there is a problem or not. 
simply because the, the things are not uh, available, are not uh, enabled in, the, in that browser. So as you see, I need to log in again. So I'm logged in, fine, let's go back, to, let's do some navigation. And then we are going to go to our uh, Elastic, do some refresh. I don't remember if I put the last 15 minutes. Yes, I did put. So as you see, we're starting to get some data. So first enemy is the ad blockers, basically, because with the ad blockers, you'll receive no, literally no information. And that is very sad, especially when you are starting a product, which is the moment when it's most likely you'll have the most problems. If your people, if your customers have this kind of extensions, with some customers, you can ask them politely to disable those extensions for your website, but it will be a hard uh, thing. You can send them a pizza guy with a pizza and say like, while you're having your pizza, let me disable the extension for you. This can work, maybe. But you can try. You can send that pizza guy to me with two pizzas, uh, Diavola and Margarita. Um, now let's, let's go to our application. Let's, go, let's see what we can see in this transaction. So beautiful graphs. Usually these kind of graphs are really nice to show to management so that they can buy the product. And then we scroll down, where is the actual thing happening? So what we'll see, we'll see here the trace sample and you see one out of one, okay, because I have only one. But the idea is that, you remember I was saying that if ever you have lots of the same, lots of problems of the same nature, you'll, it will record just a couple of them. Now what we can see in this application, in this trace, we'll see the information about the, our page that is loading, we'll have the related error of that page, and we are going to see all of the calls that have been made, and what happened behind the doors, okay? So let's look at the related error. And the related error was unhandled promise, rejection, uh, JSON parse, whatever. Okay. <coughs> we have uh, lots, of, uh, lots of information. And the thing is that, as you see, it says no stack trace available. When you are deploying your applications, it's very likely you are going to write them in TypeScript. Very, very likely. And it's very likely that your application is going to be built in, and will be minified. So what you'll have most of the times, you'll have just your JavaScript application and the stack of the minified JavaScript. If this is interesting, okay. But as you see, sometimes you can get good information. You can see what called where and, so, and what was the order, fine. However, sometimes you'll have only this kind of, this level of information, which is a sad story. What you can do, you can write vanilla JS and everything will be just fine. Uh, obviously nobody will do that, so. Um, now let's go back to our transactions. Let's go back to some, something that's more, uh, that happened this week, so that I can have a longer transaction. And uh, I'm doing a refresh. All ah, right, so I need to go back to this, and then see that this week, I need to remove the filter then I'll have my transactions. So going back to the transactions, what is very interesting here is the following. Wait, why is this weak? And I don't see what I wanted to see. Maybe it's not this weak. No, one moment. Let me, let, let me try to navigate in the website because navigating in the website will give us some uh, information. Let's try to do some another errors. Oh no. And let's go back to our uh, transactions. All right. Another F5. Remember, it takes some time. Sometimes you have live data, sometimes you don't. It really, it really depends on what you're doing. And no, I still don't have them. Well, that's a bummer. Ah, right, I have them here, right. Everything is fine. So, 
I have this kind of information. In some traces, you'll see information like this. Click input, click HTML, click div, click span. So whenever you are developing your application, you are going to write, you are going to put beautiful design, beautiful CSS, uh, beautiful images, icons, everything. And 99.99, .99, you are going to avoid accessibility. Uh, adding accessibility elements to your pages. This is like, the thing is that APM apps and APM libraries, they're actually using accessibility elements to actually track the movements of your application. So by adding accessibility, titles to your buttons, images, uh, inputs, everything you have, by adding all of that, instead of having click input or click div, you are going to have click submit user or save uh, patient data. A click, uh, blah, 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 blah. Usually in French you say click, machin bidule, voila. Which is, means uh, basically click something. And you'll have all of this kind of information, which is really practical. It's much easier to understand human words than click span. Um, so let's see what happens when I click on the button. I have this, um, let me zoom out a little bit. So let's see, let's analyze a little bit this kind of trace. I'm using, uh, I'm trying to investigate a problem. I'm trying to get the doctors and suddenly the doctors are not displaying. I'm a front end developer, okay? The doctors are not displaying, what is happening? So the thing is with APM traces, you remember I was saying that in the back end we have to add it as well, front end and back end. So what is interesting with this is that me as a front end uh, developer, I don't have to know literally everything about the backend. However, what I can know is that I've clicked on a button in, the, in my app, my app send a request to the backend, I see that the backend received the request, I see that the backend is asking the database, and at some moment what I can say, what I can see is that here for example instead of using a doctor, for example, it can use this house or car, because you know it's a bug in the backend, that's it. And I'm a front-end developer, I know that I'm not looking for doctors. So what I can do, I can contact the backend team and I can tell them, hey guys, uh, boys and girls or whatever you are, um, so select from, uh, I see that in this trace you are selecting from cars instead of selecting from doctors and I'm looking for doctors. So what they can do, they can go and uh, fix the problem. So the thing is that you don't need to know a lot of backend in order to be capable of investigating something real quick. And uh, if ever you are a full stack uh, developer, which does not exist, but why not? Um, what you can do, you can as well click on, um, on this button and you can see the SQL and uh, have some fun. SQL, the most amazing language. And you can see some information about what was happening, what is the information, this SQL that uh, has been executed. Sometimes you can have the information the parameters that you send, because you know, sometimes when you are sending this parameter of yours to do doctors, what you can have, you might have as well some IDs in URL, uh, something in the body that you are sending, and what you can see is that the user that had this problem is actually sending wrong data, and why the data is wrong. Maybe it's a bug in the software, maybe it's a tentative of phishing, maybe it's a tentative of cracking your code with the bots and whatnot, can be anything else. So APMs are useful not only to investigate as a developer, but to f do anon uh, anomaly detection and all kinds of problems. Uh, security, audit, uh, investigations and whatnot. So the last thing I wanted to show you is what's called the service map. And why service, while service map is nice, this user interface is bad. Um, Let's try to do it a little bit differently. Uh, do you see in the back, do you see the screen? I'm sorry, I cannot zoom in because this, this part at the top is as well be getting big. So in c with these kind of things, what you can see is the following. You can see your application that's connected to some backend, that's going to talking to some application, to some uh, database, and eventually to some authorization server. Why these kind of things are nice? Because you can spot visually the components that are linked to your app. 
And sometimes in, instead of saying, oh, there is a problem and my app is not working because you, the bot, bad backend and whatever, you can actually analyze the thing and see some links and potentially contact the right team uh, in the spot. Every, well, everything that I'm showing here is theoretical. Let me show you something uh, from production, uh, from development of an actual project. Hopefully that interests you. Even if it's not, I will still show you. So uh, log out. Real quick, I'm going to log in into another user. So this is a project that is about to go in production. And I'm going to show you how the things are in theory versus how the things are in reality, okay? In development environment. So as you see, we already have much more applications, of course. We'll have, and this is the last 15 minutes. So let's put, uh, as we did in the last, in the other test, let's put for, uh, I don't know, 30 days. Uh, this will take a time. Every single uh, APM server is taking time when you want historical data. It really takes time. So as you see, we have uh, more application. And what is interesting, whenever you are using that, you can already see the latency. And let's uh, sort everything by latency and see whoever is the worst for obvious reasons. That's the JavaScript. You see, look, it's the numbers. Not even Java is delays, is, is, less, is, uh, is slow. This is false, actually. But um, uh, just to, to troll a bit. Um, let me uh, organize this. So let's see how the application is working. So we see lots of activity, especially here, where they identified 60 bugs, but then fixed them. Uh, and we see quite a lot of transactions. And what, what is interesting is that if ever one kind of problem or one kind of thing is triggered very often and it's slow, you'll have some information about the impact that it has over your application. That is very important to understand that. As a developer as a, and as a person that, for example, as a CTO or as a product manager. So as you see, we have lots of things, lots of transactions, some of them taking three seconds, some of them five seconds, that's a lot. Mind you, I did not know that. So um, uh, in this way, factually, you know how your application is doing. And as you see, accessibility is not there as well. So a click button, click query, why not? And uh, let's, let's open one of those, which are no, not here. Yes, let's, let's open, for example, main companies. Let's go for companies. So what will happen here? You'll have a pretty long stack trace with lots of things happening. And as you see, there's a lot of HTTP calls happening, okay, behind the doors. Well, this is inter interesting because first, you can see if you have too many calls happening in parallel. First of all, you can identify if somebody is not working well. If you are doing lots of calls, HTTP calls, is very likely you have a problem in your API because you need to do as least as smallest a number of calls possible. And this is as well a sign of rest when doing so many calls. For example, you can spot these kind of things. Null, you see? So this, beautiful. I wonder why it's null and not undefined, but um, null. Maybe some Java developer did this. Um, so yeah, you have fire and suddenly, look at that. Look, you have lots of failures for obvious reasons. Uh, but the thing is that we can identify it instantly, you see? You, we don't have to see what was the problem, blah, 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 blah. No, you just open, you see the traces that have problems and you identify them. And what's interesting, you can click on a trace and you will see a bad request and uh, what information you sent to that request and you will see lots of parameters which nobody ever cares for. And uh, apart, from an, uh, apart from security, they will want to know where this IP came from. And uh, yeah, this is, this is the, usually the, the biggest stuff. And let's go a just real quick to the service map, the thing that I was showing a bit earlier. 
So while this is my front-end application, if you will go into an actual application, then your service map is going to look somewhat different. It looks something like this. So you have pretty much everything. Apl applications calling, calling each other. Lots of stuff happening. You'll have microservice calling uh, whoever you want. So lots of stuff. Now imagine reading the information for all of that, read, trying to read the logs for everything. Many instances, every single instance with its own log. It's very difficult. And, but what's much more easier is to have an APM doing and giving some sense into whatever you are doing there. So that's pretty much it, what I wanted to show you for today. Let's go back to the slides because slides are the most important. So highlights, ad blockers. They're going to simply block everything you do, literally. And uh, there is no, nothing much you can do, especially with DuckDuckGo browser and uh, uh, Brave. It won't work. It works, however, with Firefox and uh, Chrome and the uh, Edge. No problems here. Accessibility. So yeah, add accessibility. It will make your life much more accessible when debugging. Uh, APM and ROM requires learning. It's not for free. You are installing, I'm going to solve it right away. No, you won't. You are going to cry first and then try to understand why you don't see the trace and be nervous and this is shit and let's put down a trace and whatever. No, you need to learn. You need to actually spend some couple of days to watch some YouTube videos, read some documentation. ELK documentation exists, but nobody knows where. And um, uh, you'll have, you can use this kind of service map to, to, give, to have a sense of what applications are running, where they're located, to have, to have a sense of latency. Because if you, have, if you have, if you're calling a microservice, let's imagine, and then that microservice is giving you bad information and you know for sure everything works fine, but it doesn't work. With the distributed trace, you can see that you are calling a microservice and that microservice is calling another microservice and the other one is going into timeout. So you are not receiving data because another third party is going into timeout. So you don't have to lose your hair and nerves investigating. You are just picking the phone and hitting with that phone on the desk of the developer who did that. <coughs> so everything is seen as one infrastructure regardless of where it's running. Again, you can see dependencies. You can see third-party services that you are interacting with. And if ever one third-party service is not working, you go to dependencies, you see it's down. For example, fail transaction rate. You see small transaction rates. But this one, for example, look at this local host. What is that? I don't know. So 100% fail transaction rate. It's not me, it's the computer. So you can see what, who is working bad or well. And if you are afraid that latencies can be bad because things are running in different uh, clusters, don't be. Here we have an example of something running in AWS, OVH, I don't know where, I, mm, Kubernetes. And you have small latencies, 100 milliseconds, one millisecond, 39 milliseconds, so the latencies are pretty manageable, so you don't have, you don't have to be afraid of. However, this gives you an information, if ever, if ever there are tens of thousands or of milliseconds, or I don't know, tens of mi seconds, minutes, you will know that there might be a timeout, an IO, anything. So you have all latencies, which is fine. And under 40 milliseconds for everything that runs in the same cluster, so it's fine. Uh, logs, yeah, usually when you use one tool to rule them all, you'll have logs associated with some distributed trace. Meaning that you as a developer, front-end developer, you find a problem and you see that it's on a microservice level, fine. You take this link, this URL from the app, you are sending this through Slack because Slack is the best. This is false, Discord is the best. So you are sending through Discord and the person on the other side, the developer, backend developer is going to open the link and is going to investigate further. You see the thing? So it's an instant communication. This is really, really powerful. And uh, yes, you better use. Yes, so the logs 
this is archaeology. You have to read a lot. Nobody loves to read, so just don't. You can use APM distributed traces and you'll understand most of the times what you have there. Uh, you have, uh, at a glance, a real good input about what your application, uh, what's happening with your application, and you can put this on big TVs, and when is the World Cup, watch football, and then use it for dashboards <coughs> afterwards. Um, but the idea is that you can put it on TV and live, in live, uh, real, almost real time, have, um, have data with the exception with ad blockers. No ad, blocker, uh, ad blockers, no data, so. Yes, when you're using managed services, it's under five minutes. To create an Elasticsearch stack, it will take you five minutes on your phone. My first d thing, I did it uh, before going to sleep on the phone, so. It's real, qu real quick. Pros and cons, oh, that's a lot of stuff. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. True. Uh, any other question? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is about GDPR. Of course, uh, um, it's not very GDPR friendly, of course. So what you what you will want to do is the following. First of all, you're going in all of your backend applications, you are going to uh, review all of the log that you're doing. That's number one. Second, you are going to go into your APM system and you are going to configure the retention of the APM data. And normally it should be two weeks, okay? GDPR usually says five days from the request. You have to comply during five working days. Well, two weeks, five days, who counts? So the, the thing is that you need to keep it low, but to put it short, no, literally not a single platform has an actual mechanism to protect from that. There are mechanisms to hide fields. Uh, for example, you, you are doing a post request, you are sending a body, and you can say in the application, hide this field, this field, this field, mark them as protected, so that developers cannot see them, they exist. And when somebody is saying, yes, our system can do that, yes, some of them can. And, uh, but if you are act activating such things, they are going to explode your cluster. They're just, uh, it will be very expensive. Now, that's one problem. Second problem, you are going to do backup data, right? So when you are doing backups, there is no way you can clean up your backups from GDPR. They are still going to be deleted uh, when the backup is going to be deleted. So no, n there is no real GDPR friendliness here. There is only, you can limit the impact, but you cannot completely clean it up. Sad story. Um, yeah, so any other question maybe? Yeah? The whole planet has it, yes. So what I will uh, suggest, indeed, if when you have a denial of service attack, there is no much you can do. If your front-end application is running and your APM is trying to send data to your cluster, but your cluster is under GDOS, you lose all of that data, okay? Back-end applications will still collect logs, but the front-end application will not be able to, se to send and the user will eventually refresh the page or close the tab. So there will be no APM log sent. Yes, if, when, it's, uh, when, it's this, when there are IO problems, network IO, you'll lose the data, yes. It's not persistent, unfortunately. Some of the libraries are trying to save them locally, but it's dangerous because you can explode the data locally. It's just too much data. Yeah, another, yeah. This is, uh, this can happen, by the way, I don't know if you saw, but recently it was just crazy, the last couple of days. Any other question? Yes. Um, do you feel like the application is going heavier when you have this APM running because it hides together all the, the requests? Yeah. Is it in the case, in the cache? And yeah. It, push it, to the server? it does, it does. It, uh, it becomes heavier, 100%. And what we can do, actually, we can open real quick. 
We can do a little test. Not performance for now, but just uh, uh, let's go for network, for example. And this is a post. So we, it's sending two kilobytes per request. Honestly, when you're running a lot of time an application, it will be a lot of data. So all of this data collected and sent, it will have an impact. From all the numbers that I saw, the impact can go up to 2.5%. If the APM has some problems with the library, I saw that as well, it can go to 40% penalty. So you need to test it locally in different browsers, um, maybe on browser stack or something. Yes, indeed. This is uh, something that you have to... This is only the network, yes. Not much. Yes, it, in it does increase because for each and every information that it sends it's about 2.5 kilobytes but if it's a lot of information and for example not being able to send it will uh, st keep it locally and yes the storage will increase but at the moment things are going to be dropped because it's increasing too much you'll have a penalty most likely up to two percent most of the time so it's it's manageable i mean it's okay of course of course if all of you is going to put elk uh, then uh, yes uh, the browsers will die but you can put one Monday, next uh, Tuesday. So the users using this app will not suffer. Now I'm uh, seriously, now it's, uh, it's fine. You can enable and disable them, you know, occasionally. So it's okay. Yes? Yes. So if the user wants to phase out uh, this uh, data, I think when can simply use a brave or add block? Yeah, yes. But uh, there is no way Yes, this exists. I saw it on some websites. Some websites are actually giving you like a cookies-like pop-up saying that we are, uh, if you don't mind, we are going to profile the application while you are using the app. I saw that. Honestly, I don't know. It's, to me, it's more of a UX question. I, I, I don't know. W w you can do that. But again, pissed off users are lost usually so they're the most important you know you want to learn from their experience the most important but usually they go away so they are not going to track turn on i don't know to me it, it must be an ux question to, to put it nicely so that the user clicks yes yeah so as you see it's not uh, everything is fine but you know, in big enterprises, it's cool because you can impose everything. So yeah, that was it. Uh, thank you for uh, attention. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh huh. When you use antiviruses. Ah, uh, you you still. The, your ad blocker will still block it. Yeah, yeah by default. Uh, I saw, uh, by the way, I saw that, as you see here, um, I, I, it's not visible, sorry, but I'll tell you. I have uBlock Origin. And uh, this is the um, slide from uh, Google Chrome. It's more than 1,000 blocks already, just by displaying you these slides. So in uBlock or uh, Privacy Badger, the ones, the other that I have, Sometimes they accept localhost. When your APM is pointing to localhost, sometimes they accept it by default, but not every time. It really depends on the ad blocker that you use. But again, it's only for localhost, which is yeah. locally. Yeah, it works. Yes, yes, you, because they most of the times they work with white uh, list uh, 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 spisak. It's a list of uh, things, a list of uh, URLs. So they, they have wildcard and the URL and then they block by that. Yeah. Questions? No? Cool. Question? Yes. So when, uh, there is more, uh, yes. Yes, yes, there are best practices for that. 
And uh, the practice is the following. Usually, it comes from UX part. Every request that's under one second is good. And the thing is that every request on the front end side under one second. Meaning that regardless of what you do behind the doors, uh, regardless how many microservices you are going to call or how many microservices will, will call other microservices, you need to split this second and give a percentage of milliseconds to each and every microservice. This is what I'm doing every time when I'm developing software. I'm taking this second, this 1,000 milliseconds, and I'm saying this microservice is heavier. 100 milliseconds you have. You, have. you must answer in this time, in this time out. You see? And very slow. Yeah. In this case, I will see a couple of solutions. First, what I will do is I will talk to the, in the short term, I'll talk to UX to build an experience that is loading little by little things so that the user is not getting bored, you know, an UI that is nice to spend time with. So that will be one thing. And the, another, I'll put a cache. So Very simple, I'll put in front of it a cache. Online cache. cache. Yes, with short-lived cache, one minute, two minutes or so. And then it will be a cache for the things that are not changing often. In, f in finance, there are things, most of the things are not changing often. So just cache them. For one minute, it's, it's enough most of the time. And this will speed up very much the answer. Yes, it will be slow for the front end, but it will be like, and then off, and that is there. Yeah. Yeah, I will put cash not only on front end, but on the back end. Yes. So on uh, something that's located physically not far from the backend or from the client, and the, it will be a cache. And it can be memcache, Redis, uh, Elastic, uh, Apache Ignite, it doesn't matter. It's an in-memory cache 100% and it has to be fast. So the best cache is no cache, we know. Uh, now sometimes you have no choice. I mean, as a quick solution, when, you, when your user are like UX first to entertain, put a game maybe, and then uh, caching, and then solve the backend uh, problem. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna bring everybody into the huge, you know? Real quick, yeah.